Um, and just out of curiosity, anybody in the room here ever been part of an earthquake? Maybe like LA or overseas? Yeah, some of you. I, I, I can't begin to imagine. It has to be so surreal when the world around you <laughs> is shaking. I mean, it's got to take you to a whole new level of vulnerability when you can't even trust the ground that you're standing on. And it got me to thinking, why are there earthquakes? I mean, I, I get the whole science of it, the whole plate tectonics and how that works, but why do we have these? And then my curiosity goes to another level when I start kind of flipping through the pages of scripture, because <laughs> they're there too. And you begin to see that not only these earthquakes, these natural occurring events, but there are also these things that God uses as tools throughout the pages of scripture. That's why I'm so excited about this series over the next few weeks. We're gonna together kind of dive in and look at some of these accounts in scripture where the earth was shaken. And we're gonna look at them and, and, and try to unpack some of the aftershock. And in all of that, we're gonna hear from God's word and I think we're gonna be able to see how he purposefully uses these in the lives of his people. And if you're new to the Bible, what I'd share with you is that when you, when you kind of look at scripture, we see kind of three overarching ways that God uses earthquakes. And we're gonna kind of unpack these in this series. Sometimes we see him uh, kind of use these uh, revolving around judgment that's coming. Um, other times, they're leading up to a time of deliverance of God's people. And sometimes he simply uses it as a tool of communication, and that's what we're gonna see tonight uh, in 1 Kings 19. But man, John MacArthur says something that really got my attention this week. He's just a brilliant scholar and theologian. Look what he has to say about earthquakes in scripture. He says this. He says, an earthquake doesn't make suggestions. It's making commands. It doesn't ask for attention. It demands it. It doesn't just hope will contemplate and act. It brings almost instant obedience. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but that's exactly what we're gonna see tonight unfold in 1 Kings chapter 19. So if you brought a Bible with you, go ahead and pull it out. Uh, if you've got your version app, I promise I won't think you're texting, go ahead and get it out. And if you don't have that, you can just follow along the screen. Uh, that'll be awesome. But before we dive into 1 Kings 19, let's backtrack just a little bit to 1 Kings 18. I want us to see what has just finished up in the life of Elijah. And if you are with us a couple weeks ago in our Idol series, we totally unpacked this story. Elijah, when we meet him tonight, is coming off probably the best day of his life, literally. He's come out of an epic battle where basically he was challenging all this false idol worship, all these false prophets who claim to be God. He boldly, with the power of God, got in their face and said, no, these are not gods. There is one true God alone. And he goes up on this mountaintop and he literally challenges these 300 false prophets to a God off. <laughs> He's like, bring it. You call on your false gods, I'll call on mine, and will the real God please stand up? <laughs> and his God, our God in 1 Kings 18, he shows up, and man, he shows up in miraculous fashion with incredible power and provision. It's one of the most epic battles and victories in scripture. So when we meet Elijah tonight, he's coming off a good day, like Super Bowl championship. They're like, Elijah, what are you gonna do now? I'm going to Disney World, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what he'd say, but everything is good. Endorsements are coming in. He's getting ready for the big hometown parade and celebration, so they just won the championship. It's good. And that's why what we're gonna see here in a moment is so puzzling. Because <laughs> we're gonna crack open 1 Kings 19. This dude just coming off the best day of his life, and he's a hot mess. <laughs> I mean, he's just kind of had a meltdown all of a sudden. You're like, what? How, how could this be? And while 1 Kings 19 doesn't begin with an earthquake, what it does start with is with this prophet Elijah quaking in his boots. Let's unpack it together, beginning in verse one. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Hmm. <laughs> now, at first glance, it doesn't seem like too big of a deal. You're like, okay, there's some woman who's mad at you. Relax. He just got done taking down 300 false prophets. God delivered you. He showed up. So there's some crazy woman that wants to put a curse on you. Calm down. It's a big deal. You just faced off with 300 men and were successful. But for some reason, we look at this scripture and we see that he is way more scared of this woman than he ever was of those 300 men that he faced. Jezebel. Now you go, 
Who was that? <laughs> well, if I could give you kind of a modern day picture of who Jezebel was in scripture, I would say she's kind of like Disney's character, Maleficent. You know what I'm talking about? Like the mistress of evil. Oh, I mean, nasty, nasty, nasty. And she's the one who got all this worship of false gods started in the first place. She was turning everybody away from the one true God towards false gods and idol worship. She's nasty. There's stories of her stoning people to death, cutting their heads off, having people killed. And if you go to the Hebrew in the Old Testament, the Hebrew term for her literally is one bad mamma jamma. <laughs> and in fact, if you don't believe me that she's a bad person, let me ask you this question. How many of you have a good friend named Jezebel? Raise them high. Awkward. <laughs> Nobody in your carpool, Facebook, book club maybe? No because she's one of those people, like few people in our world that were so evil, their name was wiped off the baby name book <laughs> when you're trying to name your child. It's just not there. It's that bad. I mean, it's kinda like somebody has a little baby boy, they don't go on Facebook and go, hey everybody, say hello to little Hitler. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> Jezebel's in the same category. She is a bad man, my drama. Worst of the worst. So Elijah here, he finds himself square on her radar. He is the target of her wrath. And so he does what many of us would do. Pew! Runs. And he runs far and he runs fast. But what I want you to do with me this weekend is, you know, a lot of times we look at these stories in the Old Testament and we go, that's a really sweet story. We look at these as almost like fairy tales and this was a real guy just like you and me. And what I want you to begin to ask yourself as we follow his story is to maybe say our stories may be similar. Or maybe in other words, this question, who's your Jezebel as you sit here this weekend? What are you running from? I don't mean you're running from some murderous queen. I, I don't mean that. But you and I know that this life has its ups and it has a whole lot of downs. And maybe right now as you sit here this weekend, you're in the midst of the downs and you're, you're struggling to navigate through it in a healthy fashion. If so, you're gonna relate to this guy tonight because he's in the same boat. For those of you that don't know me, I've been driving back and forth since back in July, teaching at 242 a couple times a month, different campuses. I live down in Kentucky. So I've been on the road a lot more and I've been stopping at more gas stations more often. I know every gas station on I-75, I, I know them all. But I've learned something in that journey and that gas stations have improved greatly. They've like 2.0'd themselves. I mean, I go in these now, they have, uh, when I'm stopping to refuel, uh, they have things like supermarkets, uh, there's ATMs there. You can get a large pizza and some churros. I've never done that. Thought about it a few times. But all this kind of stuff. They've got flat screen TVs at the gas pump. Uh, they've got a petting zoo. They've got a water park. That's actually a car wash, but my kids don't know the difference, so don't say anything. But even with all that stuff, if I could just get honest with you, stopping to refuel has become kind of a drag for me. It just is. It seems like there's always an issue with my card. I get there, I'm getting off the exit, I just wanna get gas and get back on the road and make good time, and the thing goes up on the screen. Please see attendant inside. Why? I know there's funds on there, really, come on. I go in there and she's like, oh, sorry, this is so exciting. 10 minutes later, I'm back out there, and then there's a series of questions. It's like the ACT, there's all these questions I gotta figure out. Debit or credit? Would you like a car wash? Would you like to use your speedy rewards? What's your zip code? Why do you need to know that? Is that your real hair? No, you don't have hair, that's a drag. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Refueling used to be fun. Remember when you were a kid and you wanted to pump the gas? Remember trying to top it off, just right, to get it right to zero? And if it went to a penny over, no, oh man. <laughs> Refueling used to be fun. <laughs> Not anymore. But I tell you what I wanna do this weekend as we kinda of cuddle up next to Elijah, is I wanna take that negative image of culture and I want to try to help us understand in the spiritual life, this whole idea of refueling that we know so well in the automobile life, <laughs> it is critical. It is critical for us to have a healthy, vibrant relationship with God. I love that at 242, this team is intentional about health in many ways and taking care of each other not just ministering to people, but that we're healthy as a, as a team. And one of the ways we, we analyze that and look at that around here and have accountability is through this thing we use called RPMs. You're gonna see it up on the screen. I love this. 
It gives us a chance to all the time be asking each other in love, hey man, how you doing? How you doing relationally? How you doing physically and mentally? How you doing spiritually? Because we know we need to be healthy in each of these areas. And we're gonna see tonight when we meet Elijah, he is struggling <laughs> in every one of these. The dashboard of his life is just lit up with lights. Engines revved, he's guzzling gas, but he's going absolutely nowhere. <laughs> so let's start here in verse three and let's see how he's doing, first of all, relationally. It says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And so we see right here that not only does Elijah run, but he does what many of us do when life gets tough. He goes into this posture <laughs> and he pushes everybody away. He isolates himself, kind of becomes his own island, and he keeps everybody in his life at a distance. He pushes his family away, he pushes his friends away, he isolates himself from his church family. And I've always thought, why do we do that? <laughs> in a time when we need people more than ever, what makes us do that? And I think scripture makes it clear that that happens because it's a tool that Satan uses. In scripture, Jesus calls us his sheep. And before you go, oh. <laughs> Don't, because <laughs> sheep are dumb. <laughs> They're defenseless. They're directionless. A sheep will walk right off a cliff. <laughs> they don't know. They're stupid. They have no clue. They'll get lost at the drop of a hat. They'll wander off into dangerous territory having no idea. Left to themselves, they're not gonna be with us very long. <laughs> They're a pathetic creature. But Jesus' scripture said he's gonna send us out like lambs to the wolves. That's some good motivational speaking, isn't it? Thank you, Jesus, all right. Lambs to the wolves, how are we gonna handle that? I mean, sheep and wolves, when you're around wolves, they don't have any weapon, they're defenseless. And what we learn when we watch sheep is that the only weapon they have is each other. And so when you see a group of sheep and there's a predator lurking, they literally bring their bodies and they'll make one big giant fur ball <laughs> so that predator can no longer attack. But if you can just get them to scatter, Couple of them, hey, what's over here? Nighty night, <laughs> right? It's curtains time, because he's got that sheep isolated. And that's exactly what Satan does to us today. We're like lambs among wolves, but the Bible says there's strength in numbers, that that's one of our great weapons. So that's why you hear Kelly tonight and us every week in here talk about getting a small group. In other words, can you name your furball? <laughs> Who's your furball? Do you have a herd that you hang with? Because if you don't, Satan is gonna get you to isolate yourself. And when you do, that's when he attacks. And when he attacks, that's when we start talking out of our heads and speaking gibberish. I'd go to that group, but no one knows what I'm going through. If I go there, they're just gonna judge me. And if I bring it up, they're gonna think I'm weak. I would go, but they probably won't even miss me or realize I'm not there if I don't go back. We get isolated and then despair sinks in. And that is right where Elijah finds himself. He's left his relationships, he's completely detached, he's isolated himself, that the pity party commence. <laughs> Verse four. While he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush. He sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. Seems like things are going well. I've had enough, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And they laid down under the bush and he fell asleep. Now, many of us can relate to this guy right here. We have been there, we've experienced that really high high, and then the crash. But in the midst of his crash, Elijah, he starts saying some pretty dangerous things. He's like thinking about taking his life. And stats tell me that there's people in this room right now who are having those same thoughts. And I wanna tell you, if you have those thoughts, please come get help. Tonight, find one of us here at church. You don't have to battle that alone. We will get you counseling and resources. We will pray with you. We will come alongside with you. And don't think you're not the only person who has those types of thoughts. So many of us have had those same thoughts. But don't let Satan isolate you. We've got to strive to be healthy relationally. We then kind of turn the corner of the story and we begin to kind of unpack the humanity of this prophet we're gonna see that he's exhausted, he's wore out, and he falls asleep. And we begin to kind of get a peek into how he's doing physically 
in verse five. Check this out. It says, all at once an angel touched him and said, hey, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he laid down again. I love this part of this passage because it says loud and clear that God cares way more about things in our life than just our spiritual stuff. He cares about our physical needs as well. It's crazy to think that in the midst of all that's going on, I mean, we've got fireballs shooting down from heaven, we've got Maleficent on the run, the scared guy, mommy! And we're running on craziness that God in the midst of all of that says, Elijah, man, Elijah, hey, listen, buddy, you're not you when you're hungry. Have a Snickers. <laughs> But, but seriously, don't overlook this. God cares about your physical needs. If you don't, leave, if you don't believe me, look at the next verse here. He, he does it again in verse seven. It says, the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, hey, get up and eat. This journey's too much for you. And so he got up and ate and drank. I want you to notice something here that's important. Whenever we see repetition in the Old Testament, it's because we didn't have exclamation points in Hebrew. <laughs> and so when God wanted to show emphasis to something, he would use repetition. They would say things multiple times to say, this, do this. And God's saying loud and clear, Elijah, listen, I'm not just gonna use you to great things in the world, but I care about you as a person as well. I wanna make sure you're taken care of. And so I ask you tonight, how are you doing physically? What's your pace and your schedule? Is it just a blur? Is there never any open squares on the calendar? How much sleep do you get? Do you ever get a chance to exercise? How are your finances? How is your life right now physically? Because I think a lot of us think that God only cares about what we can do for him. <laughs> or that God only cares if we're being good. But man, I love that in this moment of despair, the hand of a comforting father reaches down to Elijah and he offers him food like a good father. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because in the Bible, we see God so many times called Abba, which means daddy. He's like a good parent. You can relate. When your kids were little, when they get sick, you're worried. They wake up in the middle of the night, you go in there and their fever is so hot you can feel the heat coming off their head before you even touch it. And even though you're like, what day is it? God help me put one foot in front of the other, I'm so tired. You're getting the wet washcloth and you got it on their head and they're like, mommy, mommy, whoa, wait a second. You're holding the puke bucket and they're puking, you're holding their hair back and you're trying not to throw up yourself and rubbing their back. It's okay, dear God help me, you know? But you're concerned because they're not well, they're your kid and you love them and you're concerned. Our God is concerned when one of his kids is not well. He wants to be there to provide and to bring comfort. I love that. It goes on in verse eight and says this. It says, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Oreb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night. This is where this story gets super cool. What's cool is about where Oreb is. See, Mount Oreb is the second peak of another significant mountain in scripture, Mount Sinai. And so when we see Elijah begin to climb into the clefts of the rocks to kind of hide and get away, we go, oh. And we start to see a similarity between he and another Hebrew prophet leader who with the power of God faced strong opposition and looked in the face of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And scholars think that it very well could be this same cave where Moses saw the glory of the Lord, where Elijah is about to hear from God himself. And we begin to see how he's doing mentally. Look at verse nine. It says, the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, well, I've been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They, they've put your prophets to death with the sword and I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. Here's the problem with all of that. None of it's true. <laughs> None of what he just said is true. It's all lies. Because when you backtrack to the chapter before in verse four, this is what the word said. It said, while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and had hidden them in two caves. 
50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. He's not all alone. <laughs> he's not the only one left. But here's what Elijah's done to himself. In his despair, he's taken some dangerous steps. He's relationally alone now. He's isolated himself. He's physically exhausted. And now mentally, he's starting to believe all these lies. Because that's what Satan does. Satan's a masterful deceiver. The Bible literally calls him the father of lies. And so he'll speak things to us where we begin to believe it ourselves. And before we know it, his voice sounds to start to sound a lot like ours. And this is what's going on with Elijah. He's ripping off one lie after another. I'm the only one left. False. I'm the only one who can do this. False. I'm the only one who cares. False. I'm the one that can get all this done. False. <laughs> and we kind of laugh at it, but we do the same thing. We speak the lies, we speak the lies, and then we start to believe the lies we're speaking. My life's never gonna be any better. I'm always gonna be alone, I'll never meet anybody. There's no way that God could save our marriage. I'll always be depressed, nobody cares. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I read an awesome book this past month as a staff around here called Leadership and Deception. It's a great book where it's kind of a spiritual four by four to the face, this challenge to say, stop lying to yourself. <laughs> stop lying to yourself so you can lead better and you can have healthier relationships. And in this book, there's this great story about a young man and woman, they've just had a baby, the baby's a few weeks old, and I know this has never happened under your roof because you guys are perfect, but entertain me while you listen, okay? This father wakes up in the middle of the night, two, three in the morning, to the baby crying in the other room. And he's got a decision to make. Do I go in there or do I wait it out? <laughs> None of you have ever done this before, I know. The baby's crying is getting louder and louder. He knows what he ought to do. But he sits there, he waits as his wife is just snoring logs next to him. He knows what he should do, but he starts having this conversation in his head. Doesn't she hear her baby? Her baby, right? What a bad mother. I bet she's faking it. Had stayed up watching all that reality television, the DVR, maybe she could help her child. Oh, starts puffing himself up. Doesn't she know all that I do for this family? Does she know I have a 7 a.m. meeting tomorrow? Can't even get up with her kid. And he's sitting there, he's just getting puffed up in rage and he's frustrated about something that he thinks she should have done that she hasn't and she has no clue. She's out like a light. She's said nothing, done nothing to anger him or harm him, but he is just riled up by all the lies that he's told himself. And I wonder how often we do that. You ever do that in your mind? Your mind full of these conversations in our heads where we, we play out the motives of the people around us. We highlight how bad they are, what they did, what they shouldn't have done. We're telling ourselves all the justifiable reasons why I can't believe I had to do this when no one else would. We do. And at some point, we gotta strive for mental health, which means we've gotta intentionally start to replace those lies with God's truth. We maybe need to seek some professional counseling that's available to go get some help. We have to bring our hands back in and we gotta start to let people in. Elijah here is struggling with every single one of these RPMs and he's looking for something to break him out of it. And God's about to do just that. There's a spiritual awakening right around the corner. And we'll see now what's going on in his life spiritually. Let's pick up together in verse 11. It says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, and it shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Hmm. See, for our friend Elijah, this earthquake was a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call to, to pay attention to what was already there. Or better yet, who was already there. Our family lives 
uh, kind of out in the woods a little bit in this time of year when it's starting to get cold. Every now and then we have a little bit of a mice problem in our house. So this time of year we, we set some traps and my youngest Cameron wants to be a vet. He would rescue every animal on this earth if he could. And so my wife's like, hey, would you mind buying some of those more humane traps? I'm like, what is that? What's a humane mouse trap? Excuse the little sticky pads. Sure, most painful money I've ever spent in my life. <laughs> We sit a few around the house, one in the pantry. And one Saturday morning, a few weeks ago, Cam comes in. He's like, Daddy! <sighs> the mouse had bit into this stuff with his teeth. And it's still alive. And its eyes are like this. <laughs> and Cameron, my son, looks like this. And he's like, Dad, do something. Set him free. So I'm like, all right. So we go outside. And I got a stick. And I don't really want to touch it, even though I'm a man. And I'm like, yeah, I got this, you know? And and when I'm trying to get it off the sticky pad, the thing bites my finger, draws blood, and I'm like, I've had it. <laughs> and just in reaction that wasn't incredibly Christ-like, I just slam everything to the concrete ground, including the mouse. My son Cameron, Daddy, the mouse! He runs into my wife crying, Daddy, killed, tried to kill the mouse, like dramatic fashion, all upset about how I've treated the mouse. And so I'm out there by myself. And I take this as an opportunity to set the mouse free forever. <laughs> because that's just the kind-hearted guy I am. So as I'm walking back into the house, this ordeal is finally kind of subsiding. It hit me. I thought, you know what? This is a perfect picture of what God must see sometimes just watching us live our lives. All of our lives are just a big hot mess. <laughs> And we're like that mouse in the trap. We're, we're caught sometimes, we're, we're stuck, we feel trapped, we know we're in trouble. God, throughout all the pages of his word, he's trying to give us ways to move towards freedom. He speaks to us, he wants to help us, and instead of allowing him to help us, we bite back. <laughs> we lash out, we, we push him away. Instead of asking for help, we insist on doing it ourselves. I got it, God, I got it. When God has come along in Ephesians 3 and offered us this, check this out. It says, didn't you know that you can and will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God? Listen to that verse again. You will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I don't know about you, but I'm in. I want that. He's saying you don't have to spend life running on empty. In closing, let me explain it this way. If you ever go to the gym, that's an entertaining place. And there's always some guy or girl that's over on the weight bench going for a, a PR, a personal record, I'm learning all these terms, a PR. And they go over there and you kind of look at all the weight they're putting on the bar and you're going, that's not gonna end well. <laughs> but I'm not gonna say anything because I'm over here with my fives going, I'm a maniac, maniac, I know. You know, I'm like, I, I can't say anything, all right? And so they're over there and here they go, they get the first one. Their face is blood red, veins popping out of their head, just a hot mess, screaming, grunting. Somebody's giving birth. They get one up. They get a second one up, and then it gets to the third one, man, and it's like here. And their arms are trembling, and they wait forever, and you're like, somebody call 911. Please, somebody do something. And finally, they go, spot! <laughs> and they yell for a spotter. It's usually the big guy in the gym, I got this. <laughs> he comes over, he kind of stands over him, and instead of just lifting it off, he's like, come on. It's like a big motivational talk. Come on. Put like doing this, like pregnancy breathing and stuff. You got this. You're a champion. You got this. You got this. Come on. You're like, just take it off them, please. But they finally lift down and they, they pull the bar off the chest of that person who's been straining underneath it. And what I learned is watching this is a lot of times those people, they wait till the last minute to call for a spot. They sit there and they strain underneath it forever, reluctant to say, a little bit of help over here. Because of their pride, they're just like, I, I got it. Sounds a lot like us. <laughs> Tonight, some of us sit in this room under the weight. There's a lot of pressure on the bar of life. <laughs> and you've been sitting there holding it for quite some time. And maybe because of your pride, you're still like, I, I can do this. I, I got this. And maybe this weekend it's time to say, Spot! <laughs> And to call for the spotter. The guy had the power to raise things from the dead. To let him come and this God who wants to lift it all off of you. All of you who were 
straining underneath it all. Would you pray with me? God, man, may, may each of us tonight, like Elijah, just be reminded of your gentle whisper. That the reality and the truth is you are here for us. And you're here for us relationally. You're here for us physically. You're here for us mentally. And man, you're here for us spiritually. God, we're calling for a spotter. Come, Lord Jesus, come. It's in your name we pray. Amen.